Greetings, and welcome to the USS Hornet for the celebration of the centennial of the aircraft carrier. I'm so excited to be here as always. My name is Captain Craig Thomas, call sign Box, and I'm the president of the Bay Area Tailhook Ready Room. We have luncheon meetings on board this ship quarterly, uh, generally featuring a guest speaker who's a, a, an active duty flag officer. Uh, if you're interested in attending any of our events, please come see me after the ceremony and, uh, and I can tell you how to get in touch with us. Uh, we have a great presentation today for you today, but before we get started, I'd like to ask you to continue standing uh, while we have the color guard present the colors. Detail for March. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in singing our national anthem. Before we get to the meat of the program, I'd like to acknowledge a few people uh, that are with us in attendance today. First, we have Captain Greg Keithley, the chief or the executive director of the Tailhook Association. We have uh, Captain Roger Welch, the executive director of the Tailhook Education.
Educational Foundation. They both came up for San, from San Diego for this event. Always happy to have you guys up here. Thanks very much for making the effort. Unfortunately, I would be remiss if I didn't pass along with deep sadness that we lost a true legend of naval aviation this past week. Dis Laird is the only Navy ace to have shot down airplanes in both the Pacific and the European theaters. Um, passed away this week at the ripe old age of 102. He was a fixture at tail hook reunions, a docent on this ship, a regular attendee at Bay Area tail hook events, and just a genuine nice guy. Rest in peace, Diz. We'll miss you. We're here today to celebrate the centennial of the first aircraft carrier, USS Langley, CV-1, upon which the first carrier takeoff was performed on 17 October 1922, and the first carrier landing was performed nine days later on 26 October 1922. And what better venue to do just that? On the very bay where Eugene Eli made the first successful shipboard landing on the armored cruiser USS Pennsylvania in 1911, and on this great warship, which was commissioned in November of 1943 and was instrumental in the winning of the war in the Pacific. We have a couple of highly qualified individuals to speak to us today about this momentous occasion. Our first speaker is a 1960 graduate of the University of Minnesota with a BA in history. He was commissioned in 1961 following graduation from OCS. He served on USS Yorktown, CVS-10, Hornet's sister ship for, um, for his first three years on active duty where he qualified as an OOD, as an ensign. He's been a docent on the Hornet for 12 years. He's also been a technical advisor for the 2019 movie Midway and for another upcoming movie called Devotion. He's also served as a consultant editor for several books, Waterfall about the Battle of Midway and USS, or US aircraft carriers 1939 to 45. I asked him last night how a guy who spent five years in the Navy gets to be an expert on aircraft carriers. His one word answer, timing. <laughs> I'm quite sure we're gonna find out that he really does know a lot about aircraft, about aircraft carriers. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Mr. Chuck Myers. Thank you, Craig, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our celebration of the 100th anniversary of the aircraft carrier. As Craig said, I'm uh, Chuck Myers. I've been a docent on board here for about 12 years now. And uh, the real answer to Craig's question from last night about how did I, after only five years of Navy service, get to be the technical consultant for the Navy on Midway and Devotion is, uh, one word answer is true, but it's serendipity. It has nothing to do with any enterprise on my part. I happened to be in the right place at the right time, and that was on board this ship when it was, uh, when it was being scouted as a potential location for the movie Midway. And from, if you make one, they want you to make more than one, assuming you were successful. When Craig was talking about that, I was thinking, uh, you know, it would be useful to establish a little humility before I start talking. So I, I was thinking about uh, what's the best example I can think of that. And, and I want to tell you a little story before I even start what I had intended to talk about. Uh, during World War II, uh, there was a some kind of an investiture uh, in London to which uh, Winston Churchill was an attendee. And after that 
uh, investiture, there was a diplomatic reception which he attended as well. And he, uh, in, that, uh, in that reception, met up with Charles de Gaulle. Now those are two egos that you really have to think about, but you know, de Gaulle said to Churchill, uh, Winston, uh, he was, Churchill was dressed in, in period costume. And so he had, uh, you know, pantaloons on and buckled shoes and, and funny floppy hat and so on and so forth. So de Gaulle's comment to Churchill was, uh, Mr. Churchill, I didn't realize this was a costume party. To which Churchill responded to de Gaulle, then why did you come as the unknown soldier? <laughs> And so, you know, that's the kind of humility that you would like to be able to establish when somebody gives you an introduction like Craig just did. So on behalf of the, uh, the Board of Trustees, the volunteers, and the, and the staff of the Hornet, who collectively we call the crew, uh, welcome to the USS Hornet Sea Air and Space Museum. The reason I'm up here, I think, although I wasn't exactly told this, probably for good and sufficient reasons, is that I'm probably the oldest artifact the museum has who actually served as a ship's company on, a, on an aircraft carrier. So as, as Craig said, I served on Yorktown some years ago. Well, I hope we can have some fun doing this because uh, you know, when I get to have an audience like you, I'm gonna tell sea stories, so you just have to be able to put up with it, all right? So we're gonna start out with that. And uh, you can figure that for the most part they're about 90% true. So let's see if we can make this uh, work and we'll, well, maybe I should turn it on, Keith, what do you think? <laughs> well, this, this is me and we'll see if it, if it isn't going anywhere. So, uh, Keith, if you would, please. So this is a, this is a, a real uh, old J.O.'s uh, version of what an aircraft carrier was like some 61 years ago now. God, I hate to think about that. Uh, so Yorktown uh, was a, another Essex-class carrier. It was uh, commissioned in about the same time frame as Hornet, uh, virtually the same uh, as Hornet. In fact, when I first saw the, the Yorktown, it was like deja vu. First saw the Hornet, it was like deja vu all over again. Um, so you're going to get a, a, an old J.O.'s perspective on things, and hopefully the slides are keeping up with me now. So uh, you already know what the agenda is. We're going to talk about uh, a welcome. Uh, we'll show you the Langley as a part of that welcome. We're going to talk about my experiences on Yorktown, and we're going to talk uh, eventually, uh, hear from uh, Admiral Dwyer about all things going on in the Navy these days. Before we do that, uh, Keith, if you would, one more, yeah, one more. Uh, I want to, this is actually a slide for a different time, but I do want to acknowledge the fact that this is a very volunteer-centric organization, and it's sort of consistent with the way the military operates these days. We have a whole ton of volunteers. The military is entirely volunteers, as is uh, a lot of the staff of the Hornet, and there you can see the organizations on that on that screen. The one that I would like to highlight is the newest one that we have, and that is the Hornet is now a PTSD uh, resource center, and uh, we're just getting started with that, really, uh, but it's blossoming, and uh, it's really pretty impressive what's, what's going on in that regard now. But if you're sitting here, you can also look down to your left, and you see that uh, their aircraft people are restoring an F-4 there. If you've seen uh, the aircraft around here, we've restored the, the TBM, that's the air group. You can see uh, what the Hornet looks like these days, so you know the restoration people are doing a good job. If you've taken a tour, maybe you uh, think the docents are doing okay as well. But one of the things that I, I really want to be sure that I mention is that not only am I a proud docent and a, part, and a proud volunteer, but I'm also part of the, the Board of Trustees, and so volunteerism is a, is a very big part of what we do around them on the Hornet. Keith, if you would, one of the things that a Hornet does these days uh, is we do a lot of uh, teaching of history and a lot of teaching of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM. 
occasionally we get into a little civics as well, and I thought I would give you a, a bit of a history lesson uh, the, this afternoon. If I didn't, the uh, education people would probably keel haul me, so I think I'll try to avoid that and just tell you a little bit about the history of the Hornet. So, in 1775, Continental Congress bought two sloops and converted them into 10-gun sloops, and they named them the Hornet and the Wasp. So the name of this ship is a legacy from 1775, so in some sense, I suppose we could celebrate the 247th anniversary of the name Hornet along with the 100th anniversary of, of aircraft carriers. I also think that it's interesting that the Continental Congress decided to name the two ships that it sent out, Hornet and Wasp. So if you think about it, there's a lot of chutzpah involved there. You send two stinging insects out to fight the Royal Navy. Now, you know, that's, that's pretty classy in my estimation. So Hornet goes on and in, in, into uh, the next uh, Hornet was uh, one that fought in the uh, Barbary Wars uh, under President Jefferson uh, from those episodes against the Barbary Pirates, uh, we get the line in the Marine Hymn to the shores of Tripoli. And we celebrate a, uh, a Marine Lieutenant by the name of O'Bannon, Presley O'Bannon. So uh, keep that name in mind because it's gonna come up a bit later in, in what I'm talking about. Another two hornets in the, in the War of 1812 we had a Hornet in the Civil War. Uh, it was actually a Confederate uh, ship that was uh, commandeered uh, or taken over by the, the, the Navy and used during the Civil War. We had one in the War of 1812. Uh, World War. <laughs> Some history major. Uh, the Spanish-American War, and then the first aircraft carrier Hornet uh, was commissioned in October of uh, 1941. That's the aircraft carrier that uh, launched the Doodle Raid, uh, was involved in Midway, and eventually was sunk while it was defending the uh, landings at, on Guadalcanal in, in late 1942. Then, in 1943, this ship, which was going to be the Kearsarge, was renamed to Hornet, and so Hornet that you're on today is that ship that was commissioned in, in 1943. Keith, if you would, I also want to do a little civic uh, primer for you today. If you uh, are familiar with the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8 gives the, the, the uh, duties and responsibilities of Congress. If you look at the, the, the two clauses, one is highlighted and one isn't. The first clause says, says that we will uh, fund basically an army periodically, but not for more than t two years. But the framers in that time frame, even though we were still just a one ocean navy at that point in time, were smart enough to know that we wanted to maintain a navy. And so, Keith, if you would, when, when we take the oath that you see on the screen here, the navy has a little extra oomph because of that Article 1, Section 8, Clause 13. And if, in the next slide you will see um, a former Chief of Naval Operations administering that oath uh, to uh, both uh, Navy and Marine Corps personnel. So we take it pretty seriously. Now, our principal speaker today is uh, Admiral Daniel Dwyer. And um, if I were to try to, to tell you all the credentials of Admiral Dwyer, I would be uh, uh, probably receiving tomatoes by the time I got through with that, so I'm not going to do it. I'm going to leave it to, to Craig to do that, so he can take all the flack. But one of the things that I noted about his credentials uh, was the fact that 25 years ago, he was the uh, Admiral Wesley MacDonald uh, Junior Officer of the Year, and that intrigued me a great deal. I spoke to him about it last night, and he, and he sort of claimed that, uh, well, he hadn't really done anything in the last 25 years. If you look at uh, those ribbons, you will note that that, that was uh, somewhat of an understatement on his part. 
Uh, I'm not going to cover them, but people always ask me what are they, so you can see on the screen what they are. But the one that really intrigues me, he probably doesn't have a ribbon for it, that's that junior officer. It didn't exist in 1961 when I was commissioned. Uh, I probably wouldn't have been a candidate for it had it existed, but it really intrigues me that it does exist. And, and, and so I want to talk a little bit about um, being a junior officer on one of these ships back in the day. And I'll try to be crisp enough so that you can understand that I still know that if I'm speaking in front of a three-star, I'm going to be really crisp and short. So, on the screen you will see a picture of the ship that I joined in, in July of 1961, USS Yorktown CBS-10. Um, I, I, I met it at Pier Echo in, in Long Beach, and for a kid from the Midwest, uh, Keith, if you'll do one more, kid from the Midwest, that's, that's what this one looked like in 1961. Practically no changes at all, I'm sure you'll all agree. Uh, and so this, uh, this kid from the Midwest who has never been on the West Coast before meets the biggest movie thing he has ever seen in his life and it was a wow experience. It was a wow experience sometime later when I came aboard this one for the first time as well, so it doesn't really go away. Now one of the things you have to know about an aircraft carrier is that there are two classes of people on, a, on an aircraft carrier. I know you're all thinking, well, obviously there are enlisted and officers. Well, that's true, but those aren't the two classes of people on an aircraft carrier. You have black shoes, like me, I was part of ship's company. And by the way, we didn't have that surface officer warfare emblem back in those days, so I didn't qualify for that. Um, and you have uh, brown shoes, which are the, 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 the uh, aviators on board. So those are really the two classes of people, and there's sort of a natural tension between those two. Uh, and it's it's both wonderful and, and strange in some ways. Uh, Keith, if you would, please. I want to tell you about the first watch that I stood on Yorktown. So I got to Yorktown in, in July of 1961. In September of 1961, we left Long Beach going west to join the 7th Fleet uh, in Westpac off Japan. First time I'd ever been off the continental United States and uh, it, it was a, a, again a kind of another wow experience. Somebody decided that this guy ought to be uh, standing watches on the bridge. And I don't know who exactly that was that decided that, but however it was decided, uh, they sent me up for my first, first watch between 8 and midnight uh, one September evening. So they told me basically, go stand in the corner over there, don't say anything, don't do anything, just stand there and watch. So I was standing in the right corner of the, of the bridge and it sort of looked like this one, this is actually the Hornets Bridge, and you see the captain's chair there. The captain was in fact in his chair and there were three other junior officers on the bridge, it was me standing in the corner. We had a launch that was about to take place and we had a, an AD-5W, you can see the, the ray dome on the bottom of that aircraft. It was on the port catapult and we were ready to launch it. And so things started happening on the bridge and the officer of the deck called the air boss and told him that he had a green deck and he called the signalman and told him to close up Foxtrot. And so I'm watching and listening and wondering what this is all about. Uh, the air boss gets on the, the loudspeaker system on, on the flight deck and, and, and announces standby to launch aircraft. The shooter on the flight deck has the AD turn up his engines to launch power and we fire the catapult. Only the catapult didn't fully fire. So keep in mind this is my first watch. I'm watching this in the dark. The pilot knew instantly that he didn't get a complete catapult shot, and so he's jamming on the brake, cutting his engines, and he's being pulled by the malfunctioning catapult all the way down the track of the, of the catapult itself. Sparks flying out from his brake shoes. He gets to the edge of the flight deck, and you can see him teeter-totter for about 10 seconds with the motion of the bow, and then off over into the side. First watch, and I'm saying, wow, I wonder if they're all like this at this point in time, but I, I can't say anything and I can't do anything, all right? I'm still standing in the corner. 
So lots of things started to happen. Um, captain instantly orders a left full rudder, and I'm thinking, why is he turning into the aircraft? Uh, somebody says the captain has the con, and all kinds of things happened, and I don't remember all of them, uh, and I didn't certainly understand all of the things that were going on, but it was a, another wow moment for me. So, sooner or later, and it seemed like it was only a minute or so, we resumed course and uh, continued uh, business as usual, having signaled the, the formation that in fact uh, we were going to turn to the left so that the, the destroyers that were with us at the time knew that what was happening with the aircraft carrier. You see on the screen what's called the maneuvering board, and I put symbols on it to show you what that formation looked like. So you see seven destroyers as a screen around the aircraft carrier, and you see one destroyer um, in what we call the plane guard position. But the seven were about a nautical mile from us each, and the plane guard destroyer was about 1,200 yards behind us, so about six-tenths of a mile behind us. So that's what it looked like. I didn't really know that at the time, although you could see this on the screen, not as the shapes that I've shown you on the maneuvering board, but as little dots on the, on the radar screen. And just to show you what happened and how, it, how all things uh, worked in that circumstance. So now Yorktown is back doing what Yorktown was doing before we launched the aircraft. And what's happening around me, I'm completely unaware of. But sooner or later, we got a, a, a call from the plane guard destroyer, which happened to be the USS O'Bannon, named after Cressley O'Bannon, and they announced that they had picked up two wet uh, but perfectly sound aviators, and so at that point in time, the captain, who I did not even know knew my name, said, Mr. Myers, transmit Bravo X-ray to O'Bannon. So, the radio telephone circuit's primary tactical circuit was right next to me. I sort of knew what to do at that point in time. And so the first order that I ever transmitted as a bridge officer on Yorktown was a message to O'Bannon telling them to give those officers, they just picked up a drink of brandy. So that was the, the, the first tactical signal that, that I administered as a naval officer. Now, it was traditional in those days, may still be for all I know, uh, that the plane guard destroyer could claim a ransom for the aviators. And so eventually Yorktown had to come up with uh, 10 gallons of ice cream in order to get the two aviators back to Yorktown. They, they came back, they were perfectly safe and sound. They were somewhat irritated by their experience. So I reflected on that after I got off watch and, and I learned a number of things and that is why in the world would the captain turn into the aircraft? Well, it turns out that the pivot point of one of these carriers is forward of the, of the island and so when you turn to the left, which is where the plane went, you're actually kicking the propellers away from the aircraft so you don't scramble the aircraft or the aviators as you're, as you're going by. So that's a standard procedure. Okay, now, after well, there you go, okay. We, we seem to have some computer problems over there. One of the things that I, I would like to tell you at this point in time is that the story that I just told you and a lot of others are in this book that you see on the screen. It's available in the, in the bookstore. It was written by the docents for the most part, some other volunteers on the Hornet, and it tells stories like the one that I just told you. So. All of the proceeds from this book uh, go to the museum, so stop by and grab one. There's a, there's a couple by me, and I'll tell you what more of them. <clears throat> if I can find my place and, and uh, well, I can tell you this story without too much trouble at all. So I don't really need slides for this or, or notes for this, but I'll do it anyway. So over the course of the next 13 months, I graduated up the food chain on the bridge and, and at some point in time the captain came to me and said, Mr. Myers, we're qualifying you as an officer of the deck underway for fleet operations. And that was sort of a wow moment. I, I was still an ensign at the time and I thought, that's, that's pretty cool. And then he uh, paused and he said, oh, by the way, uh, Mr. Strassler is leaving to return to Northern Illinois University and so you're going to be the GQ OOD 
found conditions of OOD as well. And they sort of pause and say, that's a, that's a big deal. Uh, I'm not sure I'm ready for that. And then he came back and said, oh, by the way, uh, we're going to have an operational readiness inspection in two weeks, and so I'd like you to be ready for, to do that as well. Well, an operational readiness inspection means that there are people sent out to the ship and they put you through all kinds of drills and, and make sure that you, you think you can actually operate an aircraft carrier under all the conditions that you might face. So after being an OOD for two weeks, I went through an operational readiness inspection and I used to be 6'4", and now I'm not, and that's why. One of the most interesting things you do as a, uh, you're still having that? Oh, okay. They're trying to get me off the, off the stage and that's really difficult because, you know, that would be elder abuse, so I'm gonna stay here. Uh, but thanks, Heidi. I, She's the one that would keel home me if I hadn't talked about the education department, by the way. But anyway, when you're alongside a, a, an oiler, it, it's one of the most interesting experiences. And Keith, if you'll show that slide. Uh, this is a slide, uh, yeah, go back to, that, that one's good, yeah. This is a slide that shows you an aircraft carrier alongside an oiler. If you go up, go back one more, if you will, Keith, you see what it looks like. There's the, there's the carrier, the, the oiler in the middle, and, uh, and they're also refueling a destroyer on the other side. Um, when, when you're doing that, uh, the, the standard on Yorktown at least was that um, every department head, every commander on the ship would come up to the bridge and, and uh, occupy the right wing of the bridge. And it was like a, an, a, the, the starboard version of Vulture's Row. You'd see a bunch of guys hanging over the bulwark like that looking at the oiler. On this particular occasion, Everybody was in place except the medical officer. He was late to the party for some reason. So I'm standing by the door of the pilot house watching the oiler and watching the helmsman to make sure that we weren't going to do anything stupid. And here comes Commander Green, the medical officer. Well, Commander Green and the operations officer, Commander Robinson, had a, a relationship where they're always trying to one-up each other or, or do some kind of a trick to each other. So when Green got through the door of the, on the right wing of the bridge, he saw uh, Robinson leaning over that bulwark like this and decided that he would play a trick on him. So he went up and grabbed him by both buttons. The only problem was that the commanding officer and the operations officer looked exactly alike from the rear. And he had just grabbed the captain. And I um, almost, the captain had hops I did not expect, okay? He almost went over the side, honest to God. He jumped, and then he regained his composure, turned around and looked at Commander Green, who now was green, <laughs> and calmly said, that's a hell of a way to greet your commanding officer in the morning, and recovered very nicely. I, on the other hand, was completely out of control because I was laughing so hard I could no longer be, do my job, and so I was on the other side of the pilot house at that point in time. Those are the kinds of experiences that one can have that one remembers for 60 some odd years after you leave uh, that particular position. So I will get off of here as fast as I can. Um, I just want to say that, you know, I, I served in the Navy for five years, I let 50 years go by, and I have served on Hornet for the last 12 years, and it's been a blast in all respects. And I, if, you, if you are so inclined, volunteering on, on Hornet is something I would highly recommend and would ask you to do. Thank you for your time. Uh, I, I hope uh, your experience on Martin today is great. I look forward to hearing from uh, Admiral Dwyer and with that, uh, and with just a minimal amount of elder abuse, I'll get off the podium now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chuck. 
Now, we are very fortunate today to have a, a very distinguished naval officer with us. He's a native of Alameda, a graduate of the California Maritime Academy, a career FA-18 pilot, Top Gun graduate. He's completed eight carrier deployments supporting operations Southern Watch, Iraqi Freedom, Enduring Freedom, and New Dawn, completing over 75 combat missions. His command tours have included VFA-27, VFA-106, Carrier Air Wing 8, Carrier Air Wing 17, Carrier Strike Group 9, and Chief of Naval Air Training. He, assu he assumed command of Joint Force Command Norfolk and U.S. Second Fleet in August of 2021. He's accumulated over 3,800 F-18 flight hours and 1,100 carrier arrested landings. And he has previously spoken to our tailhook group on the Hornet twice before his main claim to fame. <laughs> Please give a warm Bay Area welcome to now meet a legend, Vice Daniel Dozer Dwyer. Navy aircraft carrier, and then to impress upon you 
why we need the aircraft carrier, why it is important for our Navy and our nation uh, uh, going forward into the future. And so there, I believe they're still here, but I'd like to recognize some of the uh, of our elected officials that, that were here earlier today. They may still be in the crowd, though I don't see them right now. Uh, the vice mayor of Alameda, Malia Vallela, was here earlier with her son, Theo, uh, and also Alameda County Supervisor David Brown, as well as representing in the Congressional 4th District, Congressman Tom McClintock. Uh, thank you both for joining us here today at this historic event. The distinguished group of federal and civic leaders, industry partners, and community supporters gathered here reflect the strong bond between our Navy and the Greater Bay Area community. And Craig, thank you for recognizing at the beginning Diz Laird, a, a true legend, born here in California, a naval aviator when our nation needed him most, uh, deploying both in the European and Pacific theater. I remember meeting him here the last time I was in Baltimore, or when he was only 100. Uh, and I heard just last week he flew in an aircraft doing what he loves. And so we will miss him, and thank you for paying tribute to this, a true American hero. And if you haven't read his autobiography, uh, please pick it up. It's an incredible read of what our greatest generation did uh, to serve our great nation. Now, as it's been remarked by the previous speakers, Alameda has played a pivotal role in our naval history, serving as a home for naval aviation and its, S and its West Coast aircraft carriers from World War II until 1997. Alameda Naval Air Station was commissioned at the advent of World War II in November of 1940 and served as home to aircraft carriers that were instrumental in the war. As mentioned, Jimmy Doolittle loaded his B-25s aboard Hornet CV-8 in 1942, which would eventually strike the Japanese homeland immediately after Pearl Harbor. Other carriers that sailed from Alameda included Enterprise and Yorktown, and carriers Midway, Coral Sea, and Hancock were eventually based here in the post war years. During the war, Alameda was headquarters for a large number of auxiliary bases and airfields on the West Coast. It remained an important naval base during the Cold War and during the Vietnam War. Alameda was the home base for even more aircraft carriers, including Oriskany and Ranger. The Navy's first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, USS Enterprise, called Alameda its home from 1969 to 1983. NSA Alameda also employed thousands of local civilians who worked at the Naval Aircraft Overhaul City facility here on the base. Naval heritage courses through the veins of this town. And the heartbeat of Alameda lives on through the legacy of its community. I love this picture on the left, showing Hornet CV-12, the same ship we stand on today. In fact, likely at the same pier, birthed here in Alameda almost 80 years ago. And you may not have noticed, pictured at the top is a USS San Jacinto. Why is that important? Well, San Jacinto was the same carrier where in 1944, at the age of 20, future President George Herbert Walker Bush flew from its deck. And in the Pacific, flying the TBM Avenger that you see here on my right, President Bush answered the call in the South Pacific. Growing up in Alameda, I was inspired to become an aviator through my exposure to naval aviation. I was inspired to attend the California Maritime Academy just up the road here. And at the time, I never envisioned that I would go on to become a fighter pilot based on one of our aircraft carriers serving around the globe. Throughout my career, I've been honored to serve alongside and lead our nation's finest young men and women in the Navy and command the USS Theodore Roosevelt Carrier Strike Group when I was privileged to meet Maverick himself when Paramount 
film the latest Top Gun movie aboard my flagship. Today, not only am I the commander of U.S. Second Fleet, but I also command NATO's Joint Force Command Norfolk, where I report directly to Supreme Allied Commander Europe as one of his three Joint Force Commanders. Also in my NATO capacity, I'm the Director of Combined Joint Operations from the Sea, Center of Excellence, which is a NATO maritime think tank focused on transatlantic interoperability. All of these commands are based on the East Coast in Norfolk, Virginia, NATO's only home in North America. I am honored to lead our Navy sailors in the premier warfighting fleet in the Atlantic, deterring and when required, defeating potential adversaries. And I'm privileged to work closely with maritime leaders from our NATO allies and partner nations, enhancing our collective Navy's interoperability through a variety of exercises, training opportunities, and collaborative deployments. Second Fleet and JFC Norfolk were established in 2018 to respond to a growing threat to the security of our nation from across the Atlantic. And you can see on this map where our collective areas of operation and vigilance areas are depicted. Second Fleet securing the maritime approaches to the eastern seaboard in the western Atlantic and securing the entire Atlantic and the Arctic for NATO to ensure that the resupply and reinforcement of Europe is assured. Together, we defend the Maritime Avenue's approach between North America and Europe. We are ready to fight from seabed to space. The oceans that surround our nation are no longer a sanctuary in the maritime domain. In the Western Atlantic, we find some of the greatest threats to our homeland and to our allies and partners. This is why it's more critical than ever that we have a strong, modernized fleet that can keep our nation and our allies and partners safe and prosperous. And there is no better assurance of security and prosperity than a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier. Our aircraft carriers have deterred aggression for over a century, assuring our national security and our national interests. The aircraft carrier is the cornerstone of our Navy's ability to project power and maintain our enduring commitments to our allies and partners around the world. Over 100 years ago, at the dawn of World War I, our nation grappled with ways to gain the advantage to be strong from the seas, as President Woodrow Wilson remarked in 1914. It is clear that we were a maritime nation of commerce that needed a powerful Navy to not only defend our shores and commercial shipping interests, to project, but to project power overseas alongside our allies and partners. However, while the battleship that led us to victory in the past wars proved an enduring necessity for our nation, World War I showed that air power would win the advantage in future wars. So innovators set forth to combine these two technologies. While the backlash of World War I led public opinion toward military disarmament and away from warship construction, Article 8 of the Washington Naval Treaty provided an exemption enabling our Navy to test out this new concept. Aircraft carriers that would project air power from the sea. Out of this effort was born an innovation that has endured for 100 years. On March 20th, 1922, USS Langley was commissioned, a hybrid creation that was converted from one of the US Navy's first electric propelled ships, the USS Jupiter a coal-carried naval vessel built in 1911 at the Mare Island Naval Shipyard right here in the Bay Area. This innovation, converting the Jupiter to our first aircraft carrier, enabled the Navy to master both the sea and the air simultaneously, an advantage that would make the Navy the best in the world. Langley was only half the length of today's nuclear-powered aircraft carriers at 524 feet long, just slightly larger than an Arleigh Burke class guided missile destroyer and about 300 feet shorter than USS Hornet. I would challenge any carrier aviator today to match the skill and courage it took to launch and land an aircraft on such a short deck. 
Less than six months after commissioning, in October 1922, pioneering sailors aboard Langley put flight ops to the test at anchor in the York River near Norfolk, Virginia, when Lieutenant Virgil Griffin became the first naval aviator to launch from her deck in his Vought VE-7 aircraft. For more than a decade, Langley enabled the grand experiment of carrier aviation to thrive and evolve. She was a platform where all carrier aviators at the time learned, tested, and sharpened their skills as war in the Pacific loomed on the horizon. This groundbreaking technology set the stage for the future of naval aviation for generations of future naval carriers. In total, 11 classes of carriers have been built over the last 100 years. The Ranger class carriers were the first carriers built from the keel up. The Yorktown class followed, introducing the first hydraulic catapults on the flight deck, another game-changing innovation. Each new carrier class introduced advancements that would change the course of naval aviation and modern warfare. There was a time when ship-to-ship -ship fighting was the way of the world's oceans. Placing your ship in a position to deliver a broadside illustrated what Nelson at Trafalgar famously said, no captain can do very wrong if he places his ship alongside that of the enemy. Or at the Battle of Jutland, when in 1960, dreadnoughts of the Royal Navy, Angelico's Grand Fleet, and Shears' High Seas Fleet of the Imperial German Navy met and delivered blows at each other from massive 13-inch guns. This was naval warfare through World War I that would change in the next World War. During the Battle of the Coral Sea, carriers Yorktown and Lexington demonstrated a major shift in the dynamics of maritime warfare. They engaged in air attacks against three Japanese aircraft carriers, making this the first naval engagement in history where opposing ships never sighted or fired directly at each other. The Battle of the Coral Sea was largely seen as a draw, where the Japanese lost one carrier with another seriously damaged, where the Lexington was sunk and the Yorktown was heavily damaged. Yorktown would make it back to Pearl Harbor and was famously dry docked and repaired in 72 hours, ready for the battle upcoming at Midway. The aircraft carrier was a novel weapon, which had never been used in an open ocean enemy encounter. The over-the-horizon capability was unprecedented. Broadside to broadside, gunnery was now a thing of the past. The ability to project power over the horizon proved without a doubt that aircraft carriers would surpass battleships as the platform of choice. While battleships were still regarded as the core of naval operations, the tide would soon turn as the Yorktown class carriers, USS Hornet, CV-8, USS Yorktown, CV-5, and USS Enterprise, CV-6, demonstrated the enduring value of this platform during the Battle of Midway in June 1942. When the Navy's 324 embarked aircraft from these three mentioned carriers, supported by 110 land-based aircraft, attacked and sank four Japanese carriers, all of which had participated in the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. The Battle of Midway marked the culmination of a technical revolution in which carrier air power displaced gunnery as the primary means of delivery naval ordnance. Midway was a contest of air power that allowed the, ne the Navy to demonstrate new ways of fighting battles at sea from the air. During World War II, Hornet CV-8 alone shot down 668 Japanese planes and sunk or damage over 1.2 million tons of enemy ships, including one carrier, one cruiser, 10 destroyers, 42 cargo ships, all while steaming 155,000 miles in the process. CV-8 Hornet would serve for only one year before being sunk at the Battle of Santa Cruz Islands in October 1942. 
but in her short lifetime, she delivered a heavy punch. Without the loss of Hornet at Guadalcanal and Yorktown at Midway, only Enterprise remained in the Pacific, the low water mark of U.S. carrier presence in the Pacific in World War II. The extraordinary capabilities that carriers like Hornet and Enterprise delivered at the time changed the course of history, making the aircraft carrier the centerpiece for task force operations. So much so that by the end of World War II, Pacific Allies possessed 32 fleet and light carriers with dozens of escort carriers, many of which were built right here in the Bay Area. Within a decade, profound advancements in nuclear power offered innovative ways to improve the aircraft carrier concept. In 1954, the first naval platform to set sail using nuclear power, the U.S. submarine Nautilus, demonstrated that a ship under nuclear propulsion could stay at sea for months without refueling, limited only by its, its food on board. Just a few years later, nuclear power was introduced to the aircraft carrier, expanding the range and endurance of these powerful platforms. Thus began a new era of carrier aviation. The last three of the 11 carrier classes, Enterprise, Nimitz, and Gerald R. Ford, were constructed with a built-in power that would last 50 plus years, making them the most sustainable, and reliable war fighting platforms in the history of modern warfare. These carriers are the most survivable and versatile airfields in the world, enabling aircraft carriers to deploy at a moment's notice and fight for an extended period, no matter the environment. Our nuclear-powered aircraft carriers can transit more than 700 miles in 24 hours, and on arrival, immediately conduct sustained, sustained missions across the spectrum of military operations. They do not require refueling and need only to conduct replenishments at sea for jet fuel, food, and other supplies. Think about it. Never having to be refueled and sailing wherever international law allows. They are self-sustaining cities at sea, capable of a superior power projection and joint military operations in adverse environmental conditions. Their size and capabilities allow us to maintain command and control while conducting a full range of combat missions. They are truly modern marvels. The very first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, USS Enterprise, later Keel in 1958, and three years later, in 1961, she was commissioned and deployed for the first time. Just in time to influence the outcome of the Cuban Missile Crisis and later the Vietnam War. On her first day in theater during the 1965 Vietnam deployment, Enterprise launched 125 sorties, dropping 167 tons of ordnance. The next day, she launched 165 sorties, setting a record for strike sorties in a single day. Over the next 50 years, she adapted and innovated for missions, introducing new technologies that enabled unmatched performance and lethality throughout her life. In 2012, she conducted her 25th deployment to the Persian Gulf, cruising nearly 81,000 miles during a 238-day deployment, and flying more than 2,000 sorties in support of Operation Enduring Freedom over Afghanistan. After 51 years of sustained service, Enterprise was decommissioned, proving that she was just as combat credible during her final deployment in 2012 as she was during her first deployment to Vietnam in the 1960s. Since 1961, our nation's nuclear-powered aircraft carriers and embarked carrier air wings have projected power, sustained sea control, bolstered deterrence, and maintained our enduring commitments around the world. The first Nimitz-class nuclear-powered aircraft carrier was commissioned in 1975, and that class became the gold standard for carriers for the next 40 years. The Carl Vinson, commissioned in 1982, was a third Nimitz-class carrier and found its home right here in Alameda 
from 1983 to 1987 when NAS Alameda was decommissioned. In total, 10 Nimitz-class carriers were built, which remain the backbone of our nation's carrier fleet for the decades to come. This week, three carriers are deployed. The USS Abraham Lincoln in the Pacific, the USS Harry S. Truman in the Mediterranean, and the USS Herbert, George Herbert Walker Bush deployed this week for her, for her next deployment to the Mediterranean to relieve Truman. It seems like just yesterday I was commanding the air wing flying from the deck of this mighty warship during her maiden deployment. And now, 11 years later, I'm incredibly impressed by the continued enthusiasm, motivation, and warrior spirit that every member of that team shows as they're ready to deploy to operate forward again. While we celebrate achievements and innovation over the past 100 years of the U.S. Navy aircraft carrier, it is equally important to look ahead at how we are setting the stage for the next century. In this era of fast technology, it is awe-inspiring that we can build such sustainable platforms that have the inherent adaptability to support the air wing of the future and advanced technologies such as directed energy and unmanned systems to remain at the cutting edge of war fighting across a 50-year service life. The introduction of jet aircraft, angled flight decks, and nuclear power are all innovations that kept the aircraft carrier fleet as relevant for Cold War needs as it is for today's great power competition. The newest nuclear-powered aircraft carrier class, the Gerald R. Ford, continues the aircraft carrier legacy of innovation and adaptability that will enable her to serve our country for the next five decades. The Nimitz and Gerald R. Ford class aircraft carriers are uniquely capable of supporting a multi-mission carrier air wing for more than 75 aircraft, equipped with cutting edge technology and advanced weaponry. Stationed in Norfolk, Virginia, the USS Gerald R. Ford is getting ready for her first service retained deployment in the Atlantic later this year. Under Second Fleet Command and Control, where she will train and exercise alongside NATO allies and further refine their integration at the operational level to validate and demonstrate the advantage that four class carriers will bring to the future of naval aviation. As the first ship in its class, Ford incorporates over 20 transformational technologies into its design. Ford makes the first time for more than 40 years the Navy has designed and built a new aircraft carrier, representing a generational leap in the aircraft carrier's capacity to project power. The Ford class is a replacement for the Enterprise and Nimitz class carriers and brings improved warfighting capability, quality of life improvements for our sailors, and reduced total ownership costs. This decade, our nation's strategic forces has shifted from counterterrorism operations in the Middle East to the return of great power competition. So today and into the future, naval aviation must remain prepared to win at the high end in an increasing, in a com increasingly complex global security environment. Today we are approaching a new frontier of carrier aviation. The air wing of the future will provide capabilities to revolutionize the future of maritime warfare. The future carrier air wing will include the FA-18EF Super Hornet, the F-35C Lightning II, EA-18G Growlers, E-2D Advanced Hawkeye, and the unmanned MQ-25 Stingray. This air wing will give our fleet the capability for manned and unmanned teaming, integrating fourth and fifth generation aircraft with unmanned systems. Just last month, the pilot of an F-18 Super Hornet controlled three UAVs using an onboard tablet, directing them to perform various aerial maneuvers during a series of flight tests near Ventura, California. Manned and unmanned pairing could enable pilots to delegate tasks or incorporate UAVs into missions such as patrolling airspace, refueling aircraft, relaying communications, or delivering precision weapons in a contested environment. 
This is the first major change to the carrier air wing in a generation and will set the foundation for future advancements. These high-tech innovations paired with fifth generation power projection from our nation's carrier fleet will ensure our relevance in a highly advanced and dynamic security environment where our competitors are fielding weapons systems with the intent on shaping or denying access to the maritime global commons. But while the air wing of the future will, will have enhanced aircraft and increase our carrier's ability to project power, deter aggression, sustain sea control, and maintain our enduring commitments around the world, it's the sailors embarked on our carriers who keep our fleet ready. The innovative platforms our Navy has are nothing without our people. The United States sailor is at the heart of any Navy victory. The same fighting spirit that led naval aviators to victory 80 years ago at the Battle of Midway thrives in our sailors today. As we prepare for the high-end fight alongside our allies and partners. When our sailors take in all lines and set sail, they're ready to operate and engage from a position of strength. They are warrior tough. Our ship and our aircraft depend on America's finest men and women who demonstrate the commitment and skill day in and day out to make our warships agile, persistent, flexible, interoperable, and the most resilient force in the world. Our sailors and naval aviators are essential to the relationships we build with communities at home and with allies and partners around the world. Our Navy's enduring advantage is our workforce, both uniform and civilian, across our active and reserve components, and we value the diverse talent that we are attracting and retaining who will propel our Navy and our nation forward as they master new technologies in our aircraft and aboard our carriers. Throughout the carrier's 50-year lifespan, generations of sailors will serve within its hull, caring for that ship, taking pride in its missions, and serving as stewards who will adapt and evolve alongside these ever-evolving technologies. Tens of thousands of men and women will serve aboard the United States Navy aircraft carrier during its lifetime, influencing its mission success and sustainability. And each of these carriers leaves an indelible impression on these privileged Americans who serve on board. The United States has been and always will be a naval power. And the aircraft carrier gives our Navy the ability to project power where it's needed. Despite growing challenges and disruptions to the international rules-based order, our carrier fleet enables us to stand by our commitment to free and open sea lanes. Sea power forged our nation, and for 100 years, aircraft carriers have enabled a strong Navy, ensuring American influence around the world, expanding economic opportunities for American people, and guaranteeing the international rules-based order that underpins global security and prosperity. No other weapon system can deploy and operate forward with a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier's speed, endurance, agility, and combat capability with its airway. Our oldest nuclear-powered aircraft carriers have demonstrated they're just as relevant today as they were 40 and 50 years ago. Just last year, at the age of 40, USS Carl Vinson embarked elements of the air wing of the future to operate in the South China Sea, proving that a vintage platform can flawlessly deliver unprecedented stealth, electronic warfare, and vertical lift capabilities of the Navy's newest aircraft. This was the first time that a carrier striker operated in the South China Sea with the advanced capabilities of the F-35C, E-2D, and CMB-22. And Vincent proves it's just as combat capable and arguably more capable today than it was in 1982. 
the evolutionary character that has underpinned naval aviation since its founding is a cornerstone of the aircraft carrier's culture of innovation, giving the U.S. Navy the advantage over any potential adversary. It is no wonder that such paragons of power inspire awe in our citizens and allies and stake fear into those who wish us harm. When USS Nimitz was commissioned, President Gerald R. Ford reflected, wherever the United States ship Nimitz shows her flag, she will be seen as we see her now, a solid symbol of United States strength, United States resolve, made in America and manned by Americans. Wherever her mission is, one of defense, diplomacy, or humility, the Nimitz will command awe and admiration from some, caution and circumspection from others, and respect from all. This is a legacy of the U.S. Navy aircraft carrier, the legacy that the new Gerald R. Ford class will carry into the future. May they endure for generations to come. Thank you very much. Dozer. Excellent, excellent uh, talk. Uh, and with that, uh, that concludes the ceremony. Uh, oh, Mark, did you want to say something? Retire the colors. Yeah, yeah. Retire the colors. Detail for Mark.